Welcome to the shooting show. This week we're in southwest Scotland at the Roebucks, plus James Marchington and Gary Green are on Fox Patrol. We've gone back to the last day of the book season in Dumfriesshire. Yorkshire stalker Stuart Wilson has headed north of the border to some ground where a lot of deer sign has appeared in the restocked spruce. It's late in the afternoon and in the shaded half-light he has spotted a couple of rur close to the bottom end of the stalking ground. Things are looking promising. The first job is always to glass as much ground as possible, just in case an early opportunity presents itself. A previous recce has shown a lot of deer activity alongside some recently clear felled forest. That's where Stuart will be heading first. With the sun slowly dying over the hills, all Stuart needs to do is approach carefully and glass as he stalks, hopefully spotting a buck seeking the last rays of sunshine. Bullet placement and expansion are crucial factors to a deer stalk and Stuart has selected Gecko 105 grain soft points to ensure good downrange energy transfer and minimal carcass damage from his 243. Deer stalking is about getting into deer without them seeing, smelling or sensing you. Get the wind right and spot them before they spot you. Good quality optics is essential for this kind of work. Stuart is making steady progress but there is a lot of ground to glass and time is ticking on. A steady but deliberate stalk watching for movement and sign all the time is only interrupted by frequent use of the binoculars. Stuart spots even more evidence of deer sign in the form of some well-used tracks. All that's missing is a shootable book itself. Stalking with the wind across his face, Stuart makes sure to check his six o'clock to spot any deer that may still appear behind him. It looks like the persistent glassing has paid off as Stuart now has a book in his sights. He looks like a taker but Stuart must get in closer for the shot. A careful approach is required, it's not clear if any other deer are present and bumping an unseen beast could put paid to the stalk. Every time the buck drops its head to feed, Stuart tries to close the gap. The wind has picked up and it's blowing straight over the buck and down the hill. This really helps disguise any intentional but inevitable noise the stalker makes. The tension mounts as the buck raises his head and appears to have seen something. Keeping a good sight picture on his quarry through the Swarovski binos, Stuart prays for the buck to drop his head once more. Thankfully the buck resumes feeding. After several minutes of holding his breath, Stuart can finally exhale. At last, the book is within range. Stuart has closed well over 100 yards in a short space of time. With the book barely moving a yard over the last two and a half minutes, he knows his luck can't hold. Any moment and the book will disappear into the tree line. Stuart gets into position for the shot. The book just needs to turn broadside and offer a chest shot. Even after a long stalk, so much is still at stake. The book could disappear without presenting any opportunity.
As the buck finally turns, Stuart picks his moment, and the buck drops cleanly to a well-placed shot. The buck is carefully checked and bled in the field before extraction back to the farm to complete laddering. The gecko bullet found the hair and put the buck down, perfectly. Stuart reflects on a very successful and enjoyable evening stalk. Rushing up to Scotland for the last day of the buck season, I managed to make it in time for an evening stalk. Um, pulled onto the ground, binoculars out, glassed an area where we've had an awful lot of deer sign. Um, clear fell to one side and mature forest on the other. Got the kid out of the car, Remy 700 with a Swarovski 1.7 to 10 by 42 Z6, uh, Gecko ammunition with 105 grain soft point, loaded up and done over the gate and in. Um, went down to the bottom right hand corner of the ground um, where you can you can look up to um, some of the clear fell uh, that borders onto the, the forestry. Uh, stalked around the corner, spotted a book very early. Um, who was browsing on top of some grass. He made his way down onto the clear fell and out of sight. Um, as I sort of moved up a little bit further, managed to spot him again um, as he came up onto uh, a grassy knoll at the side of a um, stump. And he was a taker, um, so the, the stalk was on. Um, he was browsing away nice and confidently, um, completely unaware of my presence. Wind pushing straight over his back, taking the sound away from him. Every time he put his head down, I made ground on him, every time he put his head up, it was a little bit tense at some point, so I managed to stop without being seen or heard, um, got within range and squeezed off and he dropped with authority. Um, got him into the larder um, after extraction, real good condition, uh, body weight of 21.6 kilos and as we split the chest out, um, taking the heart and lungs out and then down to the, the windpipe and the esophagus where the uh, taking the head off so we can go into the chiller, ready to go to the game dealer, and it was a perfect heart shot as well. So, you know, very successful and really, really very pleased with the way everything went and the way the kit performed. Stuart Wilson there doing the do on the last day of the book season. And now, the shooting show news. This is the shooting show news. Shotgun and firearms licenses should last 10 years instead of five, the British Association for Shooting and Conservation has said. Basque has made a formal proposal to the government to extend the licence period, saying it would improve enforcement, boost public safety and cut administration costs. Basque Chief Executive Richard Ali said the proposal would streamline the entire licensing process and allow the police to concentrate on effective monitoring. 16-year-old clay shooter Amber Hill has been recognised on the national stage by winning the Sports Aid Want to Watch Award. Patron of the charity, the Duchess of Cambridge, presented her the award on Thursday, and now the young shooting star is on the BBC Young Sports Personality of the Year shortlist. The award caps an unforgettable 2013 for the skeet shooter, after she won gold at the ISSF World Cup in Acapulco in March and broke the world record in Peru. Read all about it in Clay Shooting magazine. Poaching is on the increase across the country, with police forces reporting huge changes in how poaching is carried out. According to the National Wildlife Crime Unit, poachers no longer act individually. They are organised gangs using high-tech equipment and causing huge financial losses to estates. It said reports relating to illegal poaching were on the rise. Devon and Cornwall Police said it was time to take a stand against poachers. More news in the next issue of Sporting Rifle. Stalkers shooting orphan deer are making the right decision, a new study has confirmed. Research conducted by three universities on the Isle of Rum showed that orphan deer were much less likely to survive than those with their mother's care. The results support best practice guidelines in Scotland. A spokesperson for Scottish National Heritage said it made strong moral sense to make sure calves don't suffer or struggle. And finally, George Digweed leads the sporting standings in the recently published CPSA averages. He shot an average of 95.2 over 1,560 targets. He also topped the sport trap averages. Austin Coxhead had the highest average in down the line with 98.9. Nick Marsden leads the skeet category and Chris Tate came out on top in ABT. Head online to check out the full averages and see how you're classified. That was the Shooting Show News. Thousands of families up and down the country are looking forward to a turkey dinner this Christmas and they'll get it thanks to the work of foxes like Gary Green. 
Gary's been tasked with keeping Charlie at bay at a free-range poultry farm near his home. It's a regular gig for Gary and he already has a fox box set up there. Well, I think there's 10,000 plus turkeys here. So that's a, that's a big, big amount of money invested and uh, we're coming to a crucial time. The turkeys are now full on and uh, they're out all day right up till about half three, four. So, you know, Mr Fox can give a lot of aggravation in that investment. So that's, that's why you must do this. If you're trying to earn a living from livestock of any description, what Foxy can interfere with, you've got to be on him, you know. It's at night that the turkeys are most vulnerable. Gary gets to the farm early to set out his bait and make a plan. Analysing the terrain provides a suitable bait point. Looks more like badger, that one. There might be a fox across the back of that one. So anything hanging about around the back of them houses or yeah. coming up the top there, you should pick that up. Within a few weeks of two years of when I started this fox box now, it's basically a shed uh, built like a bird watcher's house. We've, we've positioned it on top of a shipping container. Uh, it's about 14, 15 foot up. Uh, so it's nicely out the way of all the foxes uh, here in sight, unless you make them alerted to you up here. So you've got the upper end, they don't know you're here. And that's what it's all about. So you can dispatch them nice and cleanly and get them in really close. I mean, most of them shot around about 60, 70 yards here. So what goes in must come out, so if we do get caught short, we're all right. <laughs> There's a farmer coming out now to put turkeys away. You know, just as the light's going now, we're ready, because um, this is the sort of time when old Sly Fox would creep in here and nab a couple. Um, heater's working, that'd be nice. and. The, the kettle's already boiled up, ready for a cup of tea. That makes life a lot easier, and you can stay all night if you've got the time, which I often do. You don't make yourself ill sitting up high seats all night for, you know, long sessions. You know, it's a job of work to do. It's not, it's not sport. This is real pest control. Whether it's six chickens in little old lady's back garden on a small holding, which is also the same sort of stuff that I will do, or thousands of, you know, and there's a lot of free-range chickens here as well, and it's all year, there's never a time really when there's not something here, so there's always a job to be done, um, just to try and hold the numbers back, because they're just never ending, they just never cease to come. It's a larder for them, isn't it, let's face it, it's a food larder, and it's getting colder, and they'll start coming more and more frequent now, I'm sure. The fox don't have to kill them itself personally, it can frighten them to death just by going round that house and they know they're there, they start to panic if he's really intent on getting in there. And they'll be long dead before he gets there. There won't be a tooth mark on any of them. They'll all be suffocated up one end, multiple dying, you know, of hundreds. And there's, you know, 500 in, I think, in each shed. Yeah, it's, it's a strange thing. You don't have to always bite them to kill them. You know, he can frighten them to death. <laughs> We've got a full moon, which is quite useful. So that'll enhance the light a bit for the scope and you've got a little 120 floodlight out there just going across to give you a bit of ambient light, but it sucks in nicely in the scope to give you full you know, clarity and vision. So it's a good safe shot. In the pitch black there, all you need is just the eye to be looking this way of the fox or any animal, and you get an eye shine straight away. And, and my eyes are still good, so I pick it up very easily. You can even pick up rabbits out there, it's not a problem. Uh, and that just gives you the alert and then a good, a good old big amber eyes on the fox when they pick up a bit of light. In his well-equipped fox box, Gary can stay out all night, and he often does. Oh, brilliant. I'd rather be doing this than sitting indoors too much watching EastEnders, no, no disrespect. <laughs> uh, I, I don't expect to sort of shoot a big number here tonight, but you never know, you, you could. You could shoot one, you could shoot six. It has happened quite a few times. And another night, you'd think when you've got a perfect night, you could, you know, expect to see, i.e. in the snow, loads of foxes. Or well, sometimes you see one or two, and other times you sit here all night till the morning, nothing. The first fox come directly in from the hedge in front, about 140, 150 yards. 
and then he, his eyes just disappeared. He just shut off. He, he, I think he slipped away left-handed. And I think as I sort of gave a couple of squeaks to get his attention, I think you picked him up with a camera at more or less the same time as I found him with a scope. Could see him coming in nice and clear broad. So we've got a full moon as well tonight, which has topped up the light gathering a bit out there. Uh, but no, once he got downwind and he got the squeak, he, he, he got the better of him. He had to come and have a look. And then he picked up that wind of that scent line, what we'd got out there, and just come straight in within six inches of the bay. Directly in front of him was a straightforward shot at 60 yards. Reloaded straight away, covered the shot. Make sure he's not moving at all. Stone dead, first shot, perfect. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it was good to get that one because if he's going up the top end, there's all sorts of sheds up there and turkeys up there. Um, I think we could be in for another one, to be honest. And then the second fox was a strange one also. It, that came through the gateway and went round, looked like it was going to come in. Also gave that a little squeak to see if it would pull on. It didn't, it disappeared behind, but I think I said to you that I reckon for long it would come back in from that side. Very cagey, that one. But it didn't, it's, it's had a, carrying a serious limp, okay. that fox. Uh, so we let that more or less up within five or six yards of the other one. And so I went a bit quick on it for you, I think, but. And I wanted to get the fox as well. I was a bit concerned it might panic with the other one laying there and fly off. But we did get it. So a good job done for the time we're here. I'm sure the farmer will be very happy with two foxes there in the morning, especially towards Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it's a big old dog, I believe. Let's have a look at this lad. Yeah, big old dog fox. There's a good old set of teeth on the lad. Good healthy fox, nice, you know, no mange in him. There's a big lad, as you can see. Yeah, the nails are really long. Yeah, I mean, this, this gecko ammo, what we're using, this stuff. It's a good all round, uh, round for this gun, 223 calibre. It doesn't seem to fuss it, whether it's really close shooting or long range, you're just more or less straight in there every time of it. And it's 56, so it's got quite a punch to it. Yeah, it put them two down on the floor, right? No trouble there. Good weight to him. Been eating too many of these things, that's him. Yeah, he's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, he was in good order. I don't know about the other one, but this is definitely a dog. I think that's a vixen. We'll have a look in a minute. I'm we'll going to fetch the other one over. A dog and a vixen before midnight. The farmer will certainly be happy. Yeah, it's, uh, she's a uh, good size as well. More or less same shot, this one, James. Mm. Yeah, more or less exactly the same as this fella. I'm a good size fox. And as you can see, those bullets are consistently blowing. Identical, near enough, those two. A bit less worry for the farmer when he sees them two laying there tomorrow. Mm. With all this lot he's got out here all day. Because as it gets harder, the weather and colder, these guys won't worry about whether it's dark or not. They'll just want to be in here to try and feed. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. We're out every Monday, 7.30 p.m. UK time. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This is The Shooting Show.